Thank you so much, Alex. I don't know about you guys, but I'm sure everybody was singing along with that one. Such a beautiful hymn. Um, I pray that we sing that every day, right? So what does it take to follow Jesus? What does that mean? How can we know we're really following and doing what Jesus wants us to do? I've preached before about being a fan versus a follower, um, and I'm going to expand on that thought some more about what that really looks like. Has anyone ever tried to chase the wind or grab sand, like ropes of sand, you can't really grab onto it, and you can wear yourself out in the meantime trying? Um, so I think it's similar in that you can't really be a sincere follower of Jesus Christ and chase after the wind at the same time. Jesus wants us to loosen our grip and let go of our personal agendas to reprioritize what's important to us. Jesus invites us into his rest. Instead of chasing after things that supposedly bring us happiness, if you really think about it, the chief competitor to your devotion to God is not Satan or sin necessarily. It's your desire for stuff. What is devotion after all? It's a strong attachment. Got my eyes on it that kind of thing. So isn't that why we're all working so hard to get more stuff or to pay off the credit cards for the stuff we already had to have? We need to have our eyes on Jesus and him alone because Jesus knew that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He knows that. He also said, I know you need all these things. I know you need shelter. I know you need food. I know you need all these things. But if you submit your will to me day by day, you'll be able to enter into my rest we all know um, the verse in Matthew 11, uh, 28 through 30, that says, Come to me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So what, what's it going to take to us to get to be completely devoted followers of Jesus, to do our part to help finish the work here on earth by telling our families, our, our friends, our community, our world about the love of Jesus? Um, and I think all of our doctrines are important as long as they point us to Jesus. But if someone doesn't feel the love of Jesus, their hearts will turn cold. I think this is where we as a church sometimes fall short. We put the emphasis on obeying rather than knowing. Obedience natural, naturally comes out of that relationship of knowing Jesus. People need to feel the love of Jesus and know we care because we know Jesus. I think that's the best witnessing tool we can have and use is genuine Christian love. After all, that's what Jesus was all about. One of my favorite quotes about how Jesus treated people is found in the Ministry of Healing on page 143. And it says, Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired, desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he bade them follow me. So did you catch the order of all of that? So the first thing he did was he mingled with men as one who desired their good. Folks, we need to be instilled with a love for people that only a close relationship with God can bring, such that we truly desire their good. We need the same compassion that Jesus had. We need to have our hearts broken for these people that don't know Jesus or the truth because their eternal destiny is at stake. We know that Jesus does not want to lose one person, one soul. They're precious to him and should be to us as well. If our motivation to evangelize stems from the desire to have others think and do as we do, sometimes we'll run into problems. People can always debate theology, but no one can question the witness of a Christian who is genuinely driven by compassion for their fellow man. This type of witness can break down barriers that otherwise would hold firm. And the second thing he did was he met their needs. It's not enough to have compassion from afar. We need to act. Jesus didn't just feel compassion. He acted compassionately. We know that Jesus spent more time on earth healing people than he did preaching. Another quote to expand on this from the same page in Ministry of Healing said, there's a need of coming close to the people by personal effort. If less time were given to sermonizing and more time were spent in personal ministry, greater results would be seen. 
the poor are to be relieved, the sick cared for, the sorrowing and the bereaved comforted, the ignorant instructed, the inexperienced counseled. We are to weep with those that weep and rejoice with those that rejoice. People are hurting in this world. As a physician, I see it day in and day out. There is so much pain and suffering. People need to feel and know the love of Jesus. Wouldn't it be awesome to be known for our compassion in our community as evidenced by our involvement in the everyday lives of its citizens and its nonprofits that are making a difference? The third thing Jesus did at the end was then he bade them follow me. They were willing to follow him after the first two were met. So once people realize that you're genuinely concerned for them and that your motives are only to help them, they will be in much more of a receptive frame of mind to listen to your story of how you got to where you are. Why do you care about them? Because you have the love of Jesus. Um, that's, it, it's not natural to be, cared, to be concerned for other people's well-being, so they're going to wonder, what's up with you? Why do you care about me? And people you know, will literally say that. It's a God thing stemming from our daily relationship with him and opening our hearts to the Holy Spirit's working because we know that he's the only one that can change our hearts, right? So what does Jesus ask us to do? In our scripture reading today, we read about the religious leaders trying to tra trap Jesus with their questions. And this was like the third guy, I think, that had come with him with something. The, the Sadducees had come, and then here comes this Pharisee. And he was asking uh, Jesus, which commandment was the most important in the law? So Jesus answers him, and in Matthew twenty two thirty six, 36, if you want to turn in your Bibles there, it says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And then the teacher was getting ready to ask another one, and Jesus said, And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus was making the point that there are two greatest commandments, both equally important. From God's perspective, religion is not just vertical, it's horizontal. Uh, Matthew twenty two forty, 40, he continues, All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Love God, love your neighbor. When Jesus told the parable of the Good Samaritan, he defined what neighbor was for the, word, for the world. So what is a neighbor? Um, Jesus says a neighbor is anyone you can help, anyone in need, who's anyone in need whose need you can meet. That's a pretty straightforward definition. When you think about it that way, that's anybody. You know, it's not just literally your neighbor across the street or someone you get along with or someone you have like interests with. It's anyone with a need whose need you can meet. So just some more verses to reiterate this new command of love. John 13, 34, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. And verse 35, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Philippians 2, 5 through 7, in your relationship with one another, and that means all of them, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Ephesians 4, 32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ God forgave you. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. That's a lot of loving. The church needs to be a group of Jesus followers who demonstrate and authenticate their love for God through their love for others. One of my dear friends always says, church has to be more than a sermon and a potluck. And I know that kind of struck home with me because really we need to be out in our communities sharing God's love. Love just as I loved you. And the Old and New Testament hangs on this. It seems far less complicated than the big rules and regulations that the Jewish law was at that time, but was far more demanding. Um, Andy Stanley, who's a minister that I got a lot of this content from, he says, when not sure what to say or do, love like God through Christ loved you. I thought that was really powerful if you think about it. How does God love us? We can't even imagine it. It's beyond our scope of understanding, really. We know he loved us so much that he sent his own son to die on the cross for us, and he cares so much for each and every one of us and each and every one of you. When you care about someone, you're never consent, content to simply make your point. When you care about someone, your goal is to make a difference. Our goal as a church should not be just to add members, but our goal should be to make a difference in this world until Jesus comes again. 
We know that we don't have much time according to prophecy and the signs of the time are all around us like Wanda was talking about this morning with that tragedy in the church in Texas. So why not throw ourselves 110% into making a difference in our community and neighborhoods and displaying Christ's love through us and in doing so, draw others to Jesus, reflecting God's glory. I think that's exactly what Jesus would be doing. Yes, people need to know that the end is near, not to scare them, but to allow them time to get to know Jesus as your Savior, as their Savior. We don't want them to miss out on this relationship. It's a reaching out to a friend you care about and meeting their needs and then saying, man, you need to have this peace that only Jesus can give. John the Baptist said in Matthew 3.10, just as a fruit tree is expected to produce fruit, God's people should produce a crop of good, need, good deeds. God has no use for a group of people that call themselves Christians, but who live otherwise. He says every tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be chopped down and thrown in the fire. We are of no value if we are Christians in name only. If others can't see our faith and the way we treat them, we may, we may not be God's people at all. And I think there's been innumerable circumstances, and I'm sure you guys know, of situations where a supposed Christian has done something just horrific. And I think sometimes that can be even more detrimental because people say, see, that's why I don't like those Christians, you know. Jesus also said in the Sermon on the Mount that we should let our good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise us. No, so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Again, it's our job to reflect God's glory and be his lights here on earth. Another favorite quote from Steps to Christ, page 57, says, The character is revealed not by occasional good deeds and occasional misdeeds, but by the tendency of the habitual words and acts. Who has the heart? With whom are our thoughts? Of whom do we love to converse? Who has our warmest affections and our best energies? If we are Christ, our thoughts are with him and our sweetest thoughts are of him. All we have and are is consecrated to him. We long to bear his image, breathe his spirit, do his will, and please him in all things. Isn't that beautiful? The fruits of the spirit naturally flow out of this relationship. Morris Vinden kind of talks about this, and he says, if we deliberately choose to place ourselves under his control day by day by seeking that daily relationship with him, he will lead us into total dependence upon his power all the time. The growth in the Christian life is basically the growth in learning to stay in dependence upon Jesus more and more constantly and not ourselves. We can't love like Christ loved us without his working to change our characters. We've got to follow him to see how he treated people. Um, next, we're going to look in Matthew, sorry, Mark chapter 8. Jesus kind of explains to his followers what this true discipleship and following Jesus looks like. Um, and at some point in here, the slides end because, as Robert told you earlier, we have a sick little boy that uh, we didn't get a chance to finish these last night. Uh, but anyway, um, chapter 8, verse 27, it says, Jesus and his disciples went on to the village around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? Jesus knew there was kind of a buzz about what was going on. He had crowds everywhere and people were talking. And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. And Jesus turned to him and said, well, what about you guys? He asked, who do you say that I am? Peter immediately raised his hand and said, I know, I know, you're the Messiah, the anointed one. And Jesus responded this way in verse 30. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. So Jesus is like, bingo, right answer. But it's not time for everyone to know exactly who I am yet. So once he's identified himself to his closest followers, then he starts to tell them, hey, there, might, there may be a price that comes for following me. In verse 31, he says, He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed, and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. 
Peter, who just, what, three or four verses earlier had identified him as the Messiah, pulls him aside and says, don't go negative on us. You're not going to be killed. You're famous. Look at the crowds around you. Are you kidding me? You're the Messiah. The weather obeys you. No more of this death and dying stuff. In verse 33, but when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. Yikes. He was so harsh because of what he pointed out. In verse 33, he says, You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Peter, let's be honest. You're acting like a consumer instead of a follower. A consumer follows Jesus as long as there's something in it for him and it's working out for them. You're not just concerned about what's going to happen to me. You're concerned about what's going to happen to you as a result of what happens to me. Peter had an agenda, and his agenda led from strength to strength, and it didn't include suffering. If your agenda is the end, then Jesus is just the means. You're using him, essentially. So Jesus decides to use this as a teaching moment for the disciples and the crowd that was around him, and he reveals the fine print. Verse 34, whoever wants to be my disciple must take up their cross and follow me. Jesus is saying, whoever wants to be a true follower and not just a consumer, from time to time, you're going to have to deny yourself. There's going to be points of tension where what you want and what I want for you are different. In this moment, you're going to have to decide if you're going to be a consumer or a follower. If you're going to be a follower, you're going to have to say no to you and yes to me. Take up your cross means for you to die to self-determination, die to control of your own life, die to using him for your agenda. Jesus says, I don't want you to be surprised going forward. You're going to have to take up your cross. The disciples knew what the cross meant. They had seen and smelled what the cross meant and seen numerous crucifixions. The crowd must have been scared to death at this point. And he then says, before you get all freaked out, let me explain something to you. In verse 35, for whoever wants to save their life, and everybody's gone, well, yeah, I want to save my life. So he kind of starts with a common ground. Um, we'll lose it. This is true. Now, how many, no matter how many days I exercise and how well I eat and how hard I work to save my life, one day I'm going to lose it. Again, I've been around more deaths than I care to remember. It happens. We're going to die. Nobody likes to talk about it, but we know that's the end game. And Jesus is saying, don't build your identity on gaining things in the world. This goes back to that chasing after the wind thing I mentioned earlier. And he continues in verse 35, but whoever loses their life for me and the gospel will save it. Whoever chooses to follow me and loses their life or loses something of value that they're going to lose anyway, loses a relationship uh, that is going to end anyway, anyone who loses what they consider life because they chose to follow me and the cause of the gospel will save it. What seems like a loss is no loss at all, because whatever you're going to lose, you were have lost, you were going to lose it anyway. So he says, I'm giving you the opportunity to lose it with a purpose and with meaning. C.S. Lewis comments on this thought in Mere Christianity. He says, the more we get ourselves out of the way and let him take us over, the more truly ourselves we become. Our real selves are all waiting for us in him. The more I resist him and try to live on my own, the more I become dominated by my own heredity and upbringing and surrounding and natural desires. We know this. In fact, what I so proudly call myself becomes merely the meeting place for trains of events which I never started and I cannot stop. Then he says, give up yourself and you will find your real self Lose your life and you will save it. Submit to death, the death of your ambitions and favorite wishes every day and the death of your whole body in the end. Submit with every fiber of your being and you will find eternal life. When's the last time you submitted with every fiber of your being? Jesus is not done yet. Back in verse 36 of chapter 8, he says, What good is it for you to gain the whole world and forfeit your soul. Let's imagine you had everything or everybody, fans, followers, every opportunity, people look at you and say, wow, that guy has the whole world. We know people like that, right? 
Um, what good is it if you gain the whole world and at the end of this life you were trying to save, uh, that life you can't hold on to anyway, you forfeited or traded or gave away your soul? What if you realize by living this incredible life you forfeited eternity? He continues in verse 37. What can or would you give in exchange for your soul? At the end of your awesome life, you've amassed all this wealth and it dawns on you that you're about to go into an eternity to where you forfeited your soul. What would you trade? You'd trade everything, right? Look at what you've just discovered. You consider your soul of greater worth than all your possessions. There are scenarios in which you would trade everything to have your soul. That is a life-changing moment when you discover your soul is more valu valuable than all of your things. It just puts things into perspective. So my soul greater than my things. So the people who were so scared to follow him realized that whatever they were going to give up to follow him would be lost anyway. We have an opportunity to give it up to impact the destination of our souls. So this is not as big a sacrifice as you made it out to begin with, right? And Jesus says, yeah, that's right. Salvation is free. It costs us nothing. Following Christ will eventually cost us something. Following Jesus in your lifestyle and in this life and in this generation is going to eventually cost us something. At some point in the journey, there's going to be a conflict of interest. There will be times where what God wants and what I want intersect, and we may have to deny ourselves. Why? Timothy Keller in his book, Jesus the King, says, because we recognize that Jesus is our king. And we don't submit to him because we have to. We recognize he's a king who went to the cross for you and for me. So we submit to him out of love and trust. When someone gave himself utterly for you, how can you not give yourself utterly to him and follow? It's difficult and emotional. <laughs> it can feel like a death but I'm about to discover whose I really am. So are we going to be Jesus followers? I challenge you to take a hard look at what's important in your life right now. What are you chasing after? Where's your devotion? Is it things? Is it relationships? Whose agenda are you following? If your relationship with Jesus and a burning desire to tell others about what Jesus has done in your life doesn't come up in your minds list, let's get down on our knees and pray. We need to pray for conviction from the Holy Spirit to reprioritize what's important. That's what we're on this planet to do after all, reflect God's glory. Nothing else matters. Sorry. We need to give God full control, and you won't do that until you know him personally, intimately, as your friend and savior. We need to move from consumer to follower. We need to pray this prayer every day. God, I want what you want more than what I want. In the future, this is going to be a story that you tell. Which story do you want to tell? It will be a story of, I couldn't say no to me, or I decided to say no to me. Which story do you want to tell? Just follow. Eventually, it's going to cost you something, and that's okay, because the discovery that you're going to make about you and the faithfulness of your Heavenly Father. As we sing our closing hymn that Linda has played before at the end that some of you may not be familiar with entitled, Yes, Lord, and it's in your bulletin, I want us to listen to the words of this song and rededicate our lives to Jesus and truly following him. <clears throat> 